All right, so our, our third speaker is Tom Maripode. Uh, he's the Director of Advanced Interconnect Technology Development at Molex's Optical Solutions Group, where he's been for the last 20 years. He's got over 30 years' experience in the field of fiber optics, and this includes sales, marketing, design, manufacturing of optical interconnects and optical backplane technology. Before joining Molex, uh, Tom had positions in a number of places, uh, Amphenol, Fiber Optics, Rockwell Telecommunications, 22 patents to his uh, to his credit, and uh, and we see him a lot as an invited speaker. So, Tom, thanks for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to speak today about a project that we started uh, uh, over a year ago uh, as a result of these AIM photonic discussions and is now a INEMI project. Uh, we've got a great facilitator in David Gulowski. Uh He has a lot of experience in doing this, and I would say the uh, IPSR and INEMI process works very well for doing this, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And at the end of my update in the project, uh, Professor Kimberlin asked me to do to say a few words about uh, the structure of, of building a project team and what's important in that, uh, even though this is my first project. So I'll try to make some uh, observations for you. So we started this project with a discussion uh, out of the twig sessions of what can we do before uh, working towards AIM photonics uh, packaging where we don't have a chip yet. Uh, ultimately, we've got to start looking at getting optical signals on and off the silicon photonics chip, uh, but that team wasn't quite ready yet. So we talked about, um, you know, looking at the roadmaps that INME uh, and the rest of these, uh, all of your discussions published. What can we do to take some low-hanging fruit uh, and start working on a project that has some relevance towards future things? Um, so this is going to be a project called Phase 1. Uh, there'll be a project called Phase 2 and Phase 3, which will get closer and closer to doing optical you know, interconnects to the chip. Any of you that have done optical components or optical systems, um, you know, we saw some, uh, some great stuff from Peter and the previous speaker about how do we connect to chips. Uh, but within optical systems, uh, you know, it's always about connectors, whether it's electrical connectors or optical connectors. They're kind of the last thing that people think about, but they're very important in the system performance. And a uh, uh, good thing because I work in the connector company. Um, so what we're going to do with the project here is use single mode expanded beam connectors uh, to kind of prove and show to the industry that you can utilize these with silicon photonics devices, talk about what effects they will have on the system, uh, and to kind of get ready for utilizing single mode expanded beam connectors uh, out in the user community. Today we're already using multi mode expanded <coughs> beam connectors, uh, I would say they're very mature. Uh, we have high volume manufacturing going on. We've got several systems that are utilizing uh, multi-mode expanded beam connectors out in the system, working at 10 and 25 gig, so they're very well characterized. What we don't have today is a, 25, uh, is a single mode uh, interface working at anything above uh, a 10 gig or at 25 or the next generation speeds. We started off uh, with a project chair uh, with Terry Morris. Uh, Terry, um, Terry Smith, sorry, I'm thinking the wrong guy. Uh, Terry Smith, and he came up with a, a great, nice cartoon that I just kept using because it's simple. Uh, it just it, uh, describes a silicon photonics transmitter uh, going through uh, a, a couple of different types of, of connectors, a front panel connector, which is widely used today, uh, a blind mating backplane connector, uh, which, is, which is a fairly mature technology, not used as much, uh, to try and understand and show the effects to the end user community um, that, that they can trust that these will work and perform in their systems. Uh, we're also trying to look at what the next phase of these projects will be. Uh, maybe we'll have silicon photonics devices that are mounted directly on board optics, or maybe these devices will be something that will mate directly to the optical backplane connectors in the future. Um, so this is kind of phase one um, of, of doing something, I would say, fairly simplistic and high level, but has not yet been done in the industry. Um, this is all funded by the participants, so we're taking uh, no funding. There's not a lot of, um, uh, I would say, cost going forward. Almost all of the participants are already doing something in the area, so it's a nice way to coalesce work that's been going on in the, um, in the industry uh, and, and put it to some practical use that's important for all the participants. 
if we go down through uh, the members of the group, we have a mix of people who are doing uh, physical and work effort contributions as well as advisors, uh, also looking at what we're going to be doing in the advanced uh, phases of this, uh, trying to understand what the effects of a uh, air-gapped single-mode expanded beam connector will have on uh, a silicon photonic system. Uh, so quickly going down the list, uh, Molex is providing a number of interconnects. Uh, we did some of the chassis work. I'll show you some pictures of that uh, near the end here. Um, Celestica provided us with an advanced TCA chassis. I'll show some pictures of that. Juniper will be doing the system level testing in the lab in San Jose. Uh, so they'll be working with silicon photonics devices at 10 and 25 gig, uh, doing bit error rate testing as well as an optical insertion loss test set. US Connect is providing also single mode expanded beam connectors in the MXC. Um, Terry Smith uh, started the project and then I took it over as project chair and, and Terry helps us uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking at what he's gonna be doing uh, today later on in some of the working groups as advanced uh, steps two and steps three in this. Uh, and then John McWilliams, uh, Kazumi Wada, uh, also providing us with uh, uh, inputs on the road mapping and keeping us focused on what's important there. Uh, Senco joined recently. They have an expanded fiber technology as opposed to a lens base. They're going to be using expanded core fiber. Uh, so we'll hopefully be able to get that into the test demonstrator uh, if we can get through the phases of testing single mode expanded beam. Uh, Fraunhofer recently joined. Uh, they don't have anything physically to contribute uh, at this phase, but in phase two and three, uh, they have some technologies in terms of a lot of glass uh, uh, glass interposer and glass waveguide work that might be important in those phases. And then uh, on the project side, we have uh, uh, the IPSR group and Bob Fall, and then, as I said before, Dave Galowski, the facilitator, who's been fantastic in this process. What we'll be looking at uh, in the you know at a very high level is basically connector performance, how it influences. Uh, the optical link in a silicon photonics device. Um, we did start off having two different silicon photonics devices, a uh, single wavelength and a four wavelength uh, component. Uh, one of the members dropped off the team, so right now we're just working on doing a uh, single wavelength 1310 nanometer parallel device for testing. Um, and we'll be looking at insertion loss, uh, connector return loss, uh, any polarization dependent losses, um, doing some mate demate testing, uh, and seeing how that, it, that uh, influences the optical link performance. And then if, we, if we're on track in terms of timing, we'll add in some high level testing in terms of dust performance uh, and do some environmental testing as well, just so we can get through some baseline uh, to get that uh, under our belt as we move into phase two and phase three. So fairly simplistic, we're using a 13, 10 nanometer parallel device that has eight transmits and eight receives. We'll be taking that through the front panel uh, lens connector and uh, doing that as mated pair number one. And then we'll add mated pair number two in the back plane. Uh, I've got some more graphics coming up here. And then it gets a little bit more complicated when we start to look at uh, if we want to, if we have enough optical budget that we'll do three mated pairs or four mated pairs to see how that builds up to a pair of a lake. Uh, and you'll see why that gets uh, um, a little more complicated for us in a couple of these pictures that are coming up. So, fairly high level, pretty straightforward. Um, front panel test will be a uh, connector that has three ferrules. Uh, this particular backplane connector will hold four mated pairs of ferrules. And then we have the same thing for the US Connect version, utilizing the MXC, a single mated at the front panel, and then we have uh, up to six made it pairs available here to us uh, that we can loop through to build up this uh, test sequence. And then it gets a little more complicated. Uh, we discovered that if we're going to use the silicon protonics device and an insertion loss test set uh, to do the characterization, the insertion loss test set uh, needs to have a dead zone between each connector. So everywhere that we have a mated pair on the opposite side and before we get to the next connector, we have to have about three meters of fiber so that we can discriminate between the events that are happening. So we'll be able to measure insertion loss, return loss through the mated pairs, um, and that dead zone allows us to look at those individually so that we can see what's going on across all of the fibers, across all of the connectors. Uh, 
Um, so not a big deal, it's no problem. We're in a single mode fiber. Uh, just we've got to coil up these things and it ends up for, you know, looking like a little bit of a rat's nest as you go through it. Uh, the more complicating factor is when we want to add more mated pairs, so if we want to go through the backplane connector and loop through and then come back through, then we start to worry about flips and flops on our mated ferrules and we have to keep channels straight. Uh, so US Connect is working on the mapping chart for building the cable assemblies that go into these to make sure that as we add multiple loops to the test, we're not flipping and losing control of our channel counts so that when we collect data, uh, we, can, we know where we can characterize it, where we've, where we've lost things. Um, it's really important for us to have as many mated pairs as we can because the system designers like to have as many mated pairs of connectors available in the system so that they can build complex architectures. If we only have enough power in the, in the device to, to go through one mated pairs of connectors, um, that's very limited in how it can be used in a system, right? We only get one thing at the front panel, and then we've got to go right to the receiver or the transfer on the other side. The more mated pairs we can have in the system, the more complex the architecture can be where we can go through, um, you know, we can go through the racks, we can go through shuffling devices, we can go through different types of network elements so that we, we don't impair the signal through multiple mating pairs. So uh, that's part of the testing that's very important to the user community because they would love to have at least four mated pairs. Three is okay, two gets very limiting, and certainly one is, is almost unusable. In the phase that we're in right now is um, we built the chassis and we're shipping that to Juniper, it's in transit now, and we're currently identifying and building the cables. Uh, so as I said before, we have to keep track of all of these connections between the test sets and the devices to make sure that we're not uh, uh, flipping fibers. So uh, the mapping out of the jumpers and cable assemblies is in process, and we'll start to build cables here this month and get those shipped off to the Juniper lab. Uh, both Molex and Senco are building, uh, Molex and US Connector building cable assemblies, and if we've got time, we'll fit the Senco uh, expanded fiber uh, assemblies into this as well, uh, utilizing one of the backplane systems. So we'll have a, a very nice um, spread of a multi-sourced and multi multiple technologies uh, to characterize in, in the test. Once we get the cable assemblies at Juniper, we'll be doing insertion loss test, test testing, 10 gig testing, 25 gig testing, and if we, as I said, if we've got time, we'll do some dust testing and uh, environmental testing. So I snapped a few pictures of the chassis before I shipped it off. Uh, we're utilizing the ATCA chassis, uh, even though we're not powering it up. Uh, it is a very nice box for us to use because um, it's a standardized base chassis that gives us an open zone to add any type of connector we want into the back point area. So if you don't know ATCA, there's a power zone, there's a signal zone, and then there's a zone three that's open. And on the back side of the chassis, uh, you can uh, plug in cards here and this zone three is open for any type of connector, whether it be electrical or optical. Uh, so it's a very nice box for us to use. Uh, it shipped to us from Canada. These are the cards that it came with, which were also worked out perfectly for mounting the connectors. Uh, the first one here is the MXC connector. Uh, we have a single channel uh, for doing the one mate pair in the front. Uh, the blind mating MXC backplane connector that has six positions. Uh, the other card is uh, the Molex circular uh, Circular MT, which has up to three ferrules, and then our HBMT backlink connector, which can support four mated MT ferrules. Um, back, optical backlink connectors are fairly mature. Uh, we've been manufacturing and shipping these to the industry uh, for nearly 20 years now, so this, from a backlink connector standpoint, uh, there's not a lot of advancement going on. The single mode expanded beam connector that goes inside of it, that does not yet exi exist today. Uh, and as I said, we'll be putting those together in the next couple. And this is what the box looks like with the connectors mounted in it. I stuck some cables in it so you can kind of see uh, inputs going through. And then we'll, we'll come across the card and go to the backlink connector. We'll have that three meters of cable wrapped up on here. Uh, we'll come in and then coming out. And then on the back side, uh, we just mounted metal plates with the blind mating backlink connectors. Very straightforward. Uh, any problems at all with the chassis mechanics, the connectors allow for any of the card cage tolerances. Uh, the mechanics of mating the cards, they have enough float um, to allow us to have good mating conditions that won't influence the connectors. Add a quick look inside the chassis uh, so you can see when the card is mated in. 
is a fairly complex mating sequence that doesn't take up too much space on the card. So deliverables. Um, we really want to provide useful information to systems designers. Uh, silicon photonics devices are available, so uh, those things are, are well known, but they have not yet been uh, utilized with single mode expanded beam connectors. So that's a, you know, a lens interface with an air gap, going through another lens, sometimes air coated, sometimes not, depending on the loss and the reflectance. So we really want to build confidence with the user community that we've, we've got um, uh, you know, a robust interconnect that provides some value in terms of uh, use in the end user market that's much more robust than the connectors that we have today. Expanded beam connectors are much easier to clean. Uh, they're very hard to damage. Uh, so that you won't, uh, you can't scratch a fiber, and um, so you know, really, it's the confidence that we want to build up in the user community. And at the end of the project, we'll do a white paper and then uh, a webinar, and that's part of the INEMI process. And then uh, just the last couple of points here, um, you know, so my perspective, what perspective, what what builds a team? Uh, you, you really have a nice need to have a nice, well-bounded project. Uh, something that, that doesn't have a lot of mission creep and, and wanders uh, too far off base. So that was uh, very good for our start that we knew exactly what we've been working on and what we would not do uh, because we knew we had phase two and phase three coming. Um, also, uh, you know, really important to have participants who can bring value to the project, people who will do the work. Um, it's important to go out and, and ask those people and talk to them individually. Uh, also to have their manager buy-in that is part of the uh, INEMI and IPSR processes. There is management sign-off on this. So we, for myself as a participant, uh, I did have to have my management team sign off that I could drive my organization to do work. Right? So either I have to do the work or I have to drive somebody in my organization. Right? I have a machine shop that's got to do work on the chassis. I've got cable, people that have to build cables. So you've, you've got to get that buy-in from the organizations and the participants. Um, and then you, you've got to have participants that can, can have an, a vision of what's going to be needed uh, so that you can have a tight scope. Um, so you can't, if you go into these things blindly, you'll wander all over the place. So we're lucky enough to have participants and we're not doing a very complicated project here. But you know, we had to bring people in that had silicon photonics devices, that had the technologies of building the cable assemblies and the backlink connectors. Um, somebody contributed chassis. Um, so, you know, you need people who can do work and, and contribute and, and stay fairly tightly defined. Um, and then uh, also what's important is the intellectual property part of it. Um, you know, this is, in some cases, this can be pre-public, you know, pre it can be pre-work uh, you know, pre that, that companies are doing. In this case, we're not too pre because both participants were working on single mode expanded beam connectors already. Um, the chassis is not anything that has any IPR, but as we get into phases two and phase three, these things will become more important because when you ask somebody to, to contribute and do it in a public uh, manner and they have IP on things, it starts to get fairly messy. And if you've participated in MSAs, know that process. So um, the INEMI process is very nice and the IPSR process was, was very good. They've done this many times and, and that was a very smooth process for us, even though it wasn't so complicated. Thank you very much. Questions for Tom? So, I have one quick one. That is on the schedule there. Uh, is it look, I mean, is the schedule holding? You talked about them. Yeah, thank you for asking. Together and all that. So this is a, a, a quick project, which is one year, so we have to start and finish within one year, and I think uh, we end up in May uh, having to publish the, the white paper. So I, I think we're in good shape. Right. Chassis in transit to Juniper. Uh, optical cables will be there by the end of the month. So it should be good. Excellent. So, you're guessing that other phases, that would follow this one? <coughs> Yeah, so in, in uh, the next, uh, I think, is it today, Terry? We'll talk about phases two and three? Tomorrow. No, tomorrow morning, phase two and three. Uh, so the next phase is trying to bring this single mode expanded beam connector onto the silicon photonics chip. We're very close to the package. Uh, today, that, you know, most silicon photonics devices, as you saw with uh, the previous papers, we have fibers attached. Uh, 
uh, or we have a short fiber stub that goes to the end of the package and, and has an MT ferrule or some other way. Uh, so those two phases, we'll be talking about how can we bring that expanded beam connector uh, cl close or as close as possible to the chip. As, <clears throat> ask your question. I think you answered almost all of them. But uh, the sequence of, of the chip, the package, and now the connector uh, is, is really symptomatic of the uh, emergence of the subphotonics technology. Because now the big pushback is the reliability which really is falling on the connector. Uh, so when you, when you look at this group and, and how you've been able to pull in the key people to provide uh, whatever you need to, to move forward, uh, could you say a few words about your comfort with uh, proceeding forward in this technology and whether there's another bump after you get through the connector uh, for the system designer to be worried about? Yeah. My, so my understanding is that system loss budgets are going to be pretty tight uh, as we get above 25 gig. Some people have told me there is no budget at above 25 gig, uh, depending on the modulation schemes. And that may be uh, you know, a, a difference between multi-mode and single-mode high-speed systems. So we're going to be you know, very pressed with the optical budget. Right now, single-mode expanded beam connectors are probably on the order of 1.5 to 2 dB. We hope to get them to be 1 dB and, and less. Return loss looks very good. I'm seeing <coughs> around minus 35 uh, dB with AR coded lenses, so I don't think that will be a problem for us. Uh, but I, I think we're going to be challenged on the optical insertion loss budgets of both the devices and the lens performance. Um, so I, you know, this is a starting point for single mode expanded beam connectors. They're they're just starting to come off of the. <coughs> these are molded optics, just starting starting to come off the presses. Uh, but we have been working on it for a long time. Both U.S. Connect and Molex uh, have been working on the single mode version for, for a number of years. So I, I think we're going to be challenged on loss budget. If we can't get that lens to be less than a dB. That means we can't have uh, as many connectors as we would like to have in the, in the link. And that's going to be limiting to the system. Reliability wise, we're getting multi-mode lenses and connectors to pass the GR testing. Uh, for control, we're almost there with uncontrolled. Uh, I think that work will be applicator, uh, applied to the single mode, uh, but not, not quite sure yet. So I, I think we'll be okay on environmentals, at least for data center uh, applications. I don't think, I think it'll be some time before we need it out into the broader market, uh, minus 40 to 85 degrees C in terms of uh, the outside plant or any other application space. But with the data center, we should be. Apart from um, IP legal issues and sensing your IP building, do you want to say something about how you adjust your work on the sort of high display work that you have on the chips and displays? It was fairly simple for us because we had a fairly well defined uh, low hanging fruit, right? So we picked something that was kind of easy, and we're lucky enough that both, uh, uh, several of the people are working on these already. Uh, and they were already public and working on that. So that part of it was easy. Um, you know, certainly Juniper is a system health area. That's an interest in knowing how things perform. They're already doing work in that area, as, as many of the system houses are. So we, we didn't have a lot of, of IP issues solved. Um, we're, we're not revealing the methodologies for manufacturing and how we're doing our molding and things like that. So um, this one is easy. Not, not complicated at all. I think phase two and phase threes will get more complicated for us. Now we're talking about designing something specifically to couple to a silicon to a silicon <coughs> chip, how it's going to couple the methodologies there, there might be some IP in that area, beam path stuff like that. This was easy. Luckily. Yeah, Tom, can you comment on the, uh, the street cable use versus maintenance? Um Boy, it's a, it could be a long conversation. Um, I think the glass waveguides are very promising from a loss perspective at the long wavelength. I think Palmer has, a, uh, has an issue at, at, at the long wavelengths, they're very lossy. Uh, even though polymers have done pretty good for environmental work, uh, their, their crossover lock losses and just inherent losses uh, make, them, make them fairly difficult for any long distance. The glass waveguides look much more promising. 
Uh, but you know, you certainly have, you got a couple in and a couple out of it. Uh, the flyover type cables uh, have been used in, in systems for, you know, for decades now and they're very fairly well understood. Um, you know, I, I think if we ever get to a waveguide based card, it's probably going to be a glass waveguide based thing. Whether that waveguide is embedded in the PCB or rides on top of it, uh, I, I don't know the answer to, but glass looks, looks, if we have to go any distance at all, right, across a card, fiber fibers is the way to do it. Glasses, glass waveguide, probably next. However, I think it's going to be pretty good. Anything past, uh, you know, 100 millimeters or so. Okay. So, so we're scheduled for a break right now. The day is young. And please come back at quarter after the hour, okay? Thank you all the speakers. Thank you.